Welcome everybody to, I don't, I was just wondering how many years the organization that they started in, uh, I think we incorporated in 2001. So wow, 21 years. Okay, that's a long time. <laughs> so welcome to the 21st annual meeting of the Weir River Watershed Association. Um, I'm Samantha Woods, I'm a board member with the watershed. Um, we wanna welcome you to our first in-person meeting in the last three years, <laughs> um, short of being outside with you, where sometimes we meet, <laughs> either to be in the stream, clearing the stream or counting fish. Um, it's been kind of a strange several years and uh, it's nice to see some familiar and new faces tonight and f faces from the way back. <laughs> um, uh, so this is our annual meeting, so we have a little bit of business that we have to attend to rather quickly um, to vote in uh, some new board members and to thank some outgoing board members. So uh, first I want to thank the two uh, outgoing board members, Kristen Uterich and Patricia Burke, who have been longstanding. <laughs> board members. Um, I want to thank them for their time with us and I'm sure that they'll still continue to be active and engaged in the work of the association. Um, and welcome uh, uh, several new board members to the organization. Uh, Tony George, uh, Sky Thaxter, and Peter Swanson are all three joining the board this year. Peter is not here with us, he's in Costa Rica, <laughs> but he agreed to do this. So um, I want to welcome them and um, I wanted to also welcome Bob Mellers who joined us last year, but again this is the first time he's been here in a person. Um, Judith Van Ham is also a board I member. Like to have them yeah, say, say something about yeah. themselves. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. <laughs> Tony, you first. I'm first um, I'm Tony, Anthony, Tony, George. Um, I, I retired a year ago, August, so it's been 18, six, 13 months, 14 months. Um, finally have the time to give back to my community. And um, Bob actually, my good friend Bob, uh, over some beers one evening, suggested I get involved with the Weir River Watershed Association. And uh, I it really hits home for me. I'm, I grew up fishing. I love the rivers and streams. So. Your last name again, Tony. George. Yep. So I'm just a passionate environmentalist, and I love water and rivers, and <laughs> you know, enjoy working with everybody. Walks through the woods and the pine plants with um, Steve Ivan. And he's he sort of the one that said, why don't you join the board too? <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm all in against, you know, about conserving water, figuring out, educating people about things. I was an educator for 30 years, so. Oh, 31 now. <laughs> <laughs> I just, what, a couple, maybe three years ago now, Sky rescued, um, our helping provide buses for the fifth grade to get to the Weir River Woods. And I'm just deeply grateful to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will continue. Educational antics. <laughs> um. So I wanted to just then call out the name of all of the board members that are up for uh, renewal this year and ask for us to vote on them. Um, so we have to do that. So my, na my name is Samantha Woods and I'm also up for renewal. Christine Collins, who's our ever fabulous hostess. Um, Christine is from Hingham and has been a long time uh, member. Susan Wells is our treasurer. I don't see her tonight. Uh, she's also from Hingham. Ava Doss, who's from Hull, is unfortunately got the flu. Um, Judith Van Ham, who you've already is from Hull as well. Bob Mellers, uh, Anthony George, Sky Thaxter, and Peter Swanson are all up for renewal. So I'm gonna just ask for a second from the floor for that slate of board members. Can I have a second? And any discussion or concerns about any of these folks? <laughs> no, okay. Um, can I, uh, all in favor? Uh, aye. 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 All opposed? All opposed? <laughs> if you oppose, you have to become a board member. 
<laughs> the eyes have it. Thank you so much, um, everybody. And then just quickly, I thought I would say a few things about uh, what the watershed has been up to over the last few years. Um, as you just heard from Judith, uh, there's always uh, educational uh, opportunities that uh, we use the estuary center for and um, the estuary as well as supporting uh, water quality monitoring has been ongoing as well as some um, monitoring of our herring runs, which we'll be talking a lot more in depth with Brad tonight about. Um, another volunteer thing that we've been involved with is the actual cleaning and clearing of the river to en enable fish passage, in part because our river is so um, water um, scarce at times. We have vegetation growing in that normally wouldn't, and so we have to go in and actually physically remove some of that vegetation in order to keep the, the pathway open for, um, for river herring, which I'm sure Brad will bring up again tonight. Um, but the biggest issue that we have really is that water issue. It continues to be a, a, a real challenge for us. And um, you may have seen in the email that uh, got you here tonight that there was a uh, request for you to send an email to the Department of Environmental Protection uh, by tomorrow uh, supporting uh, regulations that would uh, require um, water withdrawals that are what we call grandfathered grandfathered water withdrawals to have to uh, put in place um, uh, mandatory water restrictions uh, during drought, de declared droughts for the state. It's kind of surprising to me and I'm sure to you that that's not a mandatory requirement already. But um, by changing these regulations, um, at least some of our water suppliers, those who are grandfathered would be required to do that. and in our community here in Hingham and Hall in the Weir River, the entire water withdrawal is grandfathered. So none of it is uh, permitted and none of it has any conditions on it for watering restrictions. That's not to say that we don't have watering restrictions because the people who are running this supply actually do care and want to do the best they can to have efficient use of water. But this would put in place uh, rules that say that everybody has to do that who has a grandfathered water withdrawal. So I would encourage you to take that email and please send it send it by tomorrow at five to the DEP. It was really simple. I think all you had to do was copy and paste or even there was like a click button, <laughs> which was kind of new tech to me. Like, oh, I can click this and it will go off. Um, the other thing uh, that's been going on that I wanted Joan, while she's here to speak about, is a bill that is being supported by the watershed associations throughout the state um, on drought. Uh, and maybe you can speak a little bit to it, Joan, before you run off for dinner with your sure, husband. Sure. I'll, I'll uh, sorry. Yeah. I, I am acutely aware of how tall I am and that I tower over everything. Do you need her to speak louder or some? Uh, yeah. oh, maybe over oh, here because you're not on the mic that we are on. So we're recording this for other people to enjoy later <laughs> who might not have been able to make it today. Uh, well, so first of all, um, I think I know everybody in the room, but Joan Moschino, I'm the state rep for Hingham Hall, Cohasset, and for a little while longer, North Situate, um, and a Hull resident and a former Hull selectman. Um, I know Smith very well, uh, and she is always um, right in there educating me on all of these issues. And so um, as a state representative, we have the opportunity, obviously, to file bills, and uh, I have been approached mm -hmm. by Mass Rivers. Uh, that's a long-term partnership for me. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, DER, Division of Ecological Restoration. And so we work very closely with um, Mass Rivers to um, get the line item up to $4 million. Um, and it's important to our district because that is um, the group of people who do all of the work with you to remove dams um, for restricted flow. And uh, so that work has been very gratifying now that we've got it up there, um, we thought we would tackle a new project with um, Mass Rivers, and they brought to me a bill that was filed this session by Carolyn Dykema. She's retired from uh, the legislature, and she asked me if I would file the bill for her. It didn't quite get across the finish line, um, but it got pretty darn far. Um, so we are going to work with Mass Rivers, and what it basically does is it's the bill that um, talks about, they can regulate around drought. I, I don't mean to suggest they can't when they declare it, but this would give them much more of an ability regionally 
Um, and in particular, what interested me in it is it would give us an ability to start to tackle the private while well use during droughts. So um, I think it's going to be hugely important for us. We're very fortunate because the Ware River system um, and uh, the town of Hingham and Holland Cohasset take these things very seriously. And so I think they have really good um, municipal management, um, use management. Um, they care very deeply about these issues. Um, but there's uh, more work to be done to assist them in that work and to assist our environment. Um, and so I've, you know, I've obviously been a member, I get all of your emails um, for a long time for the Rare River and also for Straining Pond. So, uh, and um, I feel like I'm north, south river adjacent. So, <laughs> you are. <laughs> yeah. So I, I uh, work very closely with some of that. So I just wanted to share that we had had a couple of successes. Um, in the budget cycle this past, this current bu budget year, and um, now we're looking to see how else um, my, my office and my team can help um, to advance some of these other important environmental concerns. So we're very excited to be working with you guys. I just wanted, since I'm up here, to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for all of the work that you continue to do. Um, this has been a very successful um, group, I think, over the years. I um, certainly valued it when I was a selectman, and I really value it now that I'm a state representative, and I know that you are the trusted resource that I can come to you for support, that you will engage, that you will give me good information, um, that you have my back and can uplift this kind of advocacy on the state level. So I just wanted to say hello, congratulations um, to the outgoing, congratulations to the incoming, and um, you know, my office is open to you all individually and collectively. Um, you have just but to pick up the phone. So. Or he'll be you. So anyway, have a great meeting, and I'm going to head out for a little bit um, until I head off to my, my spouse. So, yeah. so Thank you so much, Joan. I can't tell you how important it is to have people like Joan um, and her colleagues up in the State House who will listen and who will uh, act on some of the things that we're talking about as to the best of, of their ability. Um, but your voice, so I guess the point is, is your voice matters. It really matters. Don't think that it doesn't. Um, one email or one phone call, it can actually make the difference between whether or not something moves forward or not. And uh, so you shouldn't feel like that, that you're powerless. You indeed are not. Um, so uh, just a quick uh, other thing that I wanted to bring up is some things that we are contemplating for this year and have been contemplating. Now that, as Joan says, the, the water supply is owned uh, by the town of Hingham, and uh, we were successful in advocating that it be named the Weir River Water System because we wanted to make sure that people understood where their water was coming from, which is the Weir River Watershed. Um, we thought that was kind of a neat way to hopefully put the river front and center um, and connect it to <laughs> what people are actually pulling out of their taps. Um, so uh, myself and some other board members have been um, watchdogging, dogging <laughs> the, the Weir River Water System Advisory uh, Board Council, as well as uh, a transition um, uh, committee. And we are trying our best to try to get in the framework of governance for the new water supply management, the voice of the river, because we feel really strongly that uh, it would be important that's the one stakeholder that has no voice uh, that sits and makes decisions uh, about how it gets used. <laughs> so we would really like to see at least one voting member of any governance of this uh, new water company be representative of the watershed or representative of the interests of the river so that that voice could be heard during decision making. Um, certainly, um, you know, ratepayers' voices are heard um, and other types of voices, but whether or not the environment gets a voice um, at the moment, the current governance structure does not allow for that. So we're hopeful that in the new uh, discussions that are be, going to be happening over this last next year, that we can be influential in, in making the, perhaps the first in, I don't know if it would be the nation, but first in at least our state to have the river actually get a vote on the governance of its use. Um, it would potentially be outvoted, but it wouldn't be silenced. <laughs> 
<laughs> it couldn't be ignored. How about that? <laughs> uh, so that every decision that that make gets made, financial, infrastructure-wise, growth-wise, at least has uh, somebody who's saying, "Hey, how about how is this going to impact the river, and how can we minimize, mitigate that impact?" Because we know that that is the biggest problem that we face, and um, this summer uh, was unfortunately another drought, a serious drought, and we're seeing with climate change, much more serious droughts because it's hotter, evapotranspiration is higher, and um, and it's just qu more quickly onsetting. They're calling it flash droughts now, and you've heard of flash floods. They're now calling these droughts flash droughts. So the, the impacts are more severe, more quickly. Um, in our river system, we had no flow in the main stem of the Weir River, where we have a gauge uh, from late July almost into late October. So pretty sad situation. Uh, if you were a fish, that was in a good situation, obviously. So um, not all parts of the river are impacted quite the same way, but that part of the river that I'm referring to is the main stem just downstream of um, the Union Street Bridge where the high school is. Um, that's where the, the wells for the, the pull f from the aquifer are located and have sort of a concentrated impact. So. Um, conservation is really important and early conservation is even more important because droughts are things we see in the rearview mirror not things that we see coming so um, with that I just wanted to open it up for any new business or any other comments from our board members before we introduce our speaker for this evening I know Judith that you said you had wanted to say a few things uh, I'd like to say something at, at the tail end I don't want to it's not part of this business but okay. it is part of making sure of the environment so after the talk, after okay, the talk. okay. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments before we start the presentation? Well, again, thank you for coming out. It's really nice to see people in three dimensions uh, rather than on Zoom. Uh, as I said, this is being recorded, so hopefully um, more people will be able to learn more about what we're gonna learn tonight from uh, a very uh, lovely person who uh, has been down many times to speak on the South Shore, Brad Chase. He's a state uh, diagenous fish biologist. Did I say it right? Diagenous fish. That's the fish that goes both ways from the, from the ocean to the freshwater and from the freshwater back out to the ocean. And so he's coming here tonight um, to speak with us about um, the, the different fisheries that make up diagenous fisheries in the Weir River and what we know about them and what we can do to help them. So come on up, Brad. I'm, thank you for coming. Thank you, Sam. And uh, good to see you too in person. It's been a while. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. So again, I'm Brad Chase. I work for the State Division of Marine Fisheries. And I am a diadmus fish biologist. And I'm going to talk about these fish here that uh, switch habitats to complete their life history. They're not all that common. About 1% of the fish on the planet are diadmus. And what that means is they're born either in the freshwater or saltwater, and they switch to complete their life history. Almost all of these are anadromous, meaning they're born in freshwater and they head out to the ocean to grow and mature. The one exception is the catadromous American eel, which is born way out the Sargasso Sea and it migrates back to fresh waters. It is the only catadromous fish in North America. These are the ones we think of the most in Massachusetts. There's about 15 mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. In the Weir River, we have rainbow smelt, American eel, alewife blueback, and Atlantic tomcod. So those are the ones we have. I think we used to have sea run trout, probably not anymore, but we do have those species still in the Weir River. They can be quite abundant. That's a picture of river herring in Weymouth, and it was well over 100,000 fish seen in one school on one day. So they, they can be very abundant at times. So here's the ones that we work with the most. Upper left is the alewife swimming over a school of smelt in, in the back river Weymouth. And then the far right upper is American shad. They can be quite large, six, seven, eight pounds, really fun to catch. And that's in the, uh, let's see, that's the South River in Marshfield. Lower right left is the Rainbow Smelt. I think it's one of the best fried fish we have in Massachusetts. They're really tasty. Not as many around as they used to be. I also think in the lower right, American eel are quite tasty too. As a culture, we're kind of losing our taste to eat eel. 
Um, they are found in every freshwater drainage in Massachusetts, but they're not really that abundant. Their abundance has been going down. And there's all kinds of others. They come in different shapes and sizes. So they have a common reproductive life history, but they have different evolutionary pathways. And so you see very different fish having this diadromous lifestyle. Striped bass in the upper left is one of the biggest marine sport fish we have. And there's a beautiful sea run trout or salter trout in the upper right. I can't tell you where that's from. The locals won't let me say. <laughs> and, and there is an Atlantic tom cod, a cousin to the Atlantic cod. And then the far lower right is a Atlantic sturgeon. It's a very ancient fish. It's been that way for many, many years. It's a cousin to the short nose sturgeon, which is found in the Merrimack and Connecticut River and is endangered. So all different types of shapes and sizes. So why do they do this? It, it seems like a lot of bother to go, get up and switch where you live just to have babies some other place. But we think what happened was there was a gain in fitness. You've got two groups of fish. One group stayed put. The other group decided to migrate, and they found a gain in fitness over the ones that didn't migrate. The idea is it's an adaptation occurred a long time ago, and either it was within a gene pool, competition within a gene pool that led to this advantage, or it was environmental selection. And we ask what the advantage might be. Well, we don't know for sure. It happened a very long time ago. But we think that either freshwater fish poked out to the ocean and realized higher growth rates and higher survival by doing that, or it was marine fish that came up into freshwater areas in the cool of the spring, put their eggs in a safe place. And those young found better survival by, by being in that new place. It's probably both for the different species. They probably came to this evolutionary pathway through different uh, approaches. So um, very interesting. There's, there's not that many fish that do this. And here's a big question for tonight is, is it still an advantage? One concern I have is that through coastal development, eutrophication, um, water supply operations, is it still advantageous to bring your young up into these freshwater habitats? And it, it may not be. So why do we manage these? Well, historically, there were very big fisheries. You know, you go back 250 years here in Hingham, and, and these were really important fisheries. The herring came to us. They came up the rivers, and people would collect them for food and for bait. And they were valuable forage for all kinds of wildlife that eats them. The, these different types of marine mammals, birds, fish, they have their own migrations to intercept this diadromous migration. So they really cue on that, and it's really important for that reason. And these fish need help. That's a theme you're going to hear about in my talk tonight, is they, they're coming up on their own. They often can be obstructed very easily, and so they need help. So we have local management, state, federal, interstate management, and these groups will conduct population monitoring and assessment. There's harvest management, and there's also passage and habitat restoration. We heard earlier about the Division of Ecological Restoration, very active with habitat restoration. So there's a lot going on to try to manage these fish, and uh, that's part of my job is to help with that. I, I think we have a small group here, so if, if there's something that isn't clear, go ahead and ask. I think it's okay. And if we're running late, then I, I can take questions later on. But if, if you do have a question, go ahead. So here's who I work for. It's the Recreational and Diatomous Fisheries Program under the Division of Marine Fisheries and the Department of Fish and Game. And these two projects, I'm the project leader for these two projects. We have three biologists, and then we have two fishway crew uh, staff that help build fishways. And so this responsibility came up from laws in the 30s and 40s that uh, it used to be the towns would manage these fish, and a lot of these were privatized. And the runs started to decline because the private interests weren't really taking care of the runs, and they were over-harvested. So the legislature put this under the Division of Marine Fisheries, and it also established the DMF Fishway Crew in 1934. And that crew built a lot of fishways, the 30s right through the 80s. At times, there were six, seven, eight members of that crew, and they built some of the bigger fishways that are around now. We presently just have two, so we build smaller fishways. Um, so before, I guess I, I just want to touch on a couple things before I get into the Weir River watershed information. I think 2022 was kind of a big year. You know, we had COVID. It was kind of quiet in 2019 and 2021. A lot happened this past year. There's a new stream maintenance policy that was written by the Department of Vital Protection that makes it easier for locals to do stream maintenance to help these fish come up rivers. 
it was becoming more and more of a question mark how this activity fit under the Wetlands Protection Act. And it was a bit of a gray area. This policy makes it clear that the work can be done without a heavy permitting load because it's important. Secondly, we developed the geographic information data layer that has points in that data layer for all the different fish passageways in Massachusetts, all the dams, culverts, and it allows people to use it and to consider what restoration might be for their favorite sites. So that's going to be rolled out in the next couple of weeks where anybody can look it up and use that information data layer. We're also conducting a new coastwide survey. Last time that was done was 20 years ago to survey all these locations and put that new information into the GIS data layer. And then also River Herring Sustainable Fishery Management Plans. We had two approved last week. There's a group called the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and they manage fish that cross state boundaries and they require these plans if you want to harvest river herring. And I know in, in Hingham we're not even close to thinking about that. We just we have very few fish. But I think there's a few towns that, that wanted to have a harvest and they were approved to have a harvest just last week at the annual meeting for this interstate group. Also for 2022 for restoration, there's a lot of federal money. There's a lot of money around for big watershed projects. And I think it's, it, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but I think it's really an important opportunity for some of these big projects to advance that have been really developing for a long time. I'll mention a couple of jobs that our fishway crew did. We did six jobs this year. We only did one last year. I think we were limited by just the inefficiencies of COVID. And so we were a little more active. We do herring stocking and we stocked at five sites this year. And then we started a new shad stocking program in the Taunton River. Probably six years in development, teaming up with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Division of Fish and Wildlife to stock little shad in the Taunton River. So I just want to touch on these things because I think they're, they're kind of you know, highlights for, for the world of diatomous fish in 2022. So what I'll do is, uh, sure. Question? Yep. I, I'm going to, and it, it's, cu it's coming up. I'm going to touch on a couple, and if you have any questions on your favorite sites, let me know, because I only have a few examples, because I wanted to get into some Weir River specifics pretty soon, so I, I will come back. I'll come back to that one in particular, and I'll come back to, let's see. Well, I, that, I'll, I'll come back to that one in just a minute. I do want to touch on the species that we work with the most and the ones that are in the Weir River, river herring, American eel, and rainbow smelt. We don't have American shad here, so I won't say too much about it, but I'm going to talk about these three species now. So river herring, there's two species, alewife and blueback. They are the most abundant diatomous fish in Massachusetts. They're the ones people, I think, identify with the most because they have these iconic migrations up the river. Everyone sees them. They're really, it's exciting. It's kind of a sign of spring when you see them coming up the rivers. So I think it's it's probably our most important fish. What they do is they hatch out in freshwater habitats, they go back out to the ocean, and live for three years, then they come back to where they were born. So they do have that fidelity to where they came from. There's a lot of concern for them. There's been two petitions to list them as an endangered species recently. In both cases, it wasn't warranted. They considered it to be an endangered species, you have to be at risk of extinction. And I don't think we're there, so, but. Either way, a lot of concern was expressed in that process. And then the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, they conduct stock assessments, and they have the U.S. stocks of river herring at historic lows, the lowest amount we've seen. Although the stock assessments found in the last 10 years, certain populations are starting to come back a little bit. So, and we have some of that in Massachusetts, too. So we do a lot of river herring counting. There's over 40 sites in Massachusetts where this happens. Most of these are volunteer visual counts where local groups go out and count their fish. There's about 14 that have census level quality and that's either electronic counter in that left in photograph or the video counters in that lower right photograph. And so my agency, we maintain eight of these stations and we add biological sampling with the ones we maintain to, so we have data on the sex of the fish, the size, the age, you know, population demographics. Here's all the locations in Massachusetts. We don't have any in this watershed. The closest one is probably the Back River. And uh, we want to have at least one counting station each of the major coastal drainage areas, which are those red brackets. 
And so I think we've come a long way in the last 10 years, and we have really good counting data for river herring. So here's a graph that combines the counts for four locations that have over 20 years of data. So there's a lot going on here, but basically you've got the year on the x-axis, and you've got number of spawning run fish in the spring in the y-axis in thousands. So and that, that biggest number you see is almost two million fish in these four rivers. You can also see the harvest ban. In 2005, my agency was very concerned about the, the status of these fish after a drought in like 2000, 2000 2001, led to the declines that you see uh, down to 2005. So we banned all spawning run harvest. Since then, you can see fairly decent improvements for these four rivers. And I, I, should, I should say the yellow is the Mattapoisett River. The blue is the Namaskat River in Middleborough. The red is the Back River in Weymouth. And the green is the Monument River at the Cape Cod Canal. And so you can see that in recent years, we're, we're, we're higher than when the ban went in. We've had a couple down years. One concern I have is we all got excited when we had some good years, like 2019 had a number that was over a million and a half fish in these four rivers. And they come back as three-year-olds. So we said 2022 was going to be great. It wasn't. You can see it, it's a very low number. In fact, it was low at most places in Massachusetts. So a little concerned about that. Um, we hope not to have too many low years in a row. So, so if we zoom in into the Namaskat River, again, the spawning run counts in thousands. And then the year, so every dot is the number of fish that are estimated coming up the rivers. Before the drought, you can see 1.4 million. It's, it's probably the only time we've had over a million except for one of the site in the last 20 years. And then it plummeted right after that and we felt it was a drought response. Then you can see that modest improvement after the harvest ban, and then some real choppiness after that. And this is one of the runs that has a harvest. They asked us to have a harvest. I wrote the plan in 2016. It was approved where they were allowed to take 10% of the time series mean. That's this line right here. 10% is there, that's what they can harvest. This is the 25th percentile. If it goes below that, two years in a row, they have to cut their harvest to 5% of the time series mean. If it goes below three years in a row, they have to stop harvest. But this run, they chose not to harvest. Once they have an approved plan, it's up to the towns. And the town said, you know what, we're kind of concerned about what happened in 2017, that sharp drop, and they were concerned about being the only one open. So they chose not to harvest. They did ask to have their plan updated as a five-year plan and last week it was approved at the annual meeting of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. So they, they can have a harvest, but notice that 2022, if they get a second year below this line, then they'll have to cut that in half. I think they're not gonna have a harvest. They, they, they would like to see more rivers that have enough fish to have a harvest than to be the only one open. So they're a little concerned about that. And here's the Namaska River watershed. You can see that it's big ponds, the biggest spawning in nursery habitat for river herring in Massachusetts, over 5,000 acres. So picture that with what you have here in the Weir River watershed. We've had four towns ask us to have a harvest. We felt only two were, were reasonable to consider that. So we wrote plans for the Namaskat River. And then down the Cape in Harwich, they have 1,000 acres of spawning in nursery habitat. Their plan was approved last week as well. So now we have two, two sites. Incidentally, the two largest spawning and nursery habitats in Massachusetts, the only runs to have reached a million fish in any time in the last 20 years. So I, I think it, it makes sense that this, that considering having a small opening to allow residents to have a few fish to either use for bait or to, to eat. And so I, you know, I certainly support it when you have that many fish, but you can understand concerns people have given all these fluctuations. Okay, let me move on to American eel. So again, they're the only catatomous, meaning the only one in North America that's born at sea and comes back. They, they migrate all this distance from the Sargasso Sea. They're panmictic, which means it's a single genetic stock throughout their range. They're semilparous, which means they spawn once and die. That seems unfortunate to me, but it works for them. They have a high age of maturity. So river herring are maturing at like three or four year olds. These mature at eight to 15. Some females don't mature till 20. And the idea is the males leave at a pretty small size for their one chance to head to the Sargasso Sea. The females wait to gain a large body size to carry a lot of eggs. 
River herring carry about 100,000 eggs. Female eels carry three to 10 million. So they really put a lot into getting big body size to make that one trip way out to the ocean. And the geographic range is incredible from Brazil to Greenland, a single genetic stock. So, you know, a very successful fish evolutionary. They also, they occupy more habitat types in North America than any other fish. So they're really flexible about where they can go. A little more on their biology. So again, the adult eel is heading out to that border between the yellow and the, the orange. That's kind of the edge of the Gulf Stream. And they, they can travel, you know, one, even two thousand kilometers to have their one chance at glory. It's, it's, it's an amazing adaptation to, to spawn that far out and then send their young back. The young, when they hatch, they transform into leptocephali, which is like a leafy larvae. And they catch ocean currents and head back west towards the continental shelf. They also orientate with Earth's magnetic field, with magnetite in their head, which is crazy. And the European eel comes to the same place in the Sargasso Sea, yet they migrate the opposite way back. They, they're spawning in the same general area, but one goes west, one goes east. They have environmental sex determination, which you might have heard of is common in snakes, where they don't have a sex when they're born. They show up here, and they don't really gain a sex until their second year, and it, we think it's dependent on the density of eels in a watershed. So when a watershed is very compact and small, they tend to become males, because males want to get just so big. If it's a big watershed, lots of acreage, they tend to become females, because they want to stick around, become the queen of the area, get a large body size, and then head out. So it's pretty amazing how their densities can determine what sex they become. And are they amphibious? Not really, but they can climb. They can climb up concrete when it's wet. I've seen them twice crossing roadways in the rain. So they, they're pretty good at leaving the river if they really have to. So pretty remarkable fish all in all. Now I mentioned how 2022 was really poor for river herring, and it, it was in most places. Eels were uniformly very strong this year, and it just shows we don't really know what's going on with eels. They just, all of a sudden, this year was one of the biggest runs I've seen. Some of the places we monitor had the highest numbers in the time series. So pretty amazing. Here's a site, I can't tell you where it is. We caught thousands in a given day. That's a video system for river herring. That's a small fishway that my crew built. There's some river herring getting ready to go up the fishway and there's the eel ramp they come into. So that, that little eel ramp caught like 5,000 eels in one night. So pretty, pretty amazing. We, we built that fishway, the eel ramp, and the video counter for about $7,000. The town paid for materials and, and we did the rest. So it's kind of an efficient model to have us do this type of work if the property owners or the towns want to pay materials. All right, one last slide on eels. So we count a lot, and it's, why do we bother counting? Well, that's what we do, we're biologists. We like to measure things and count things. What you hope is the data will eventually become usable for management purposes or to help inform stock assessments. So the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission conducts stock assessments for American eels. All these stars are locations in the East Coast where, where states have eel traps that the data goes to the stock assessment. At the last stock assessment, we just had one, the Jones River in Kingston. Young of the year or glass eel trap was accepted as an index of abundance for the stock assessment. This year was kind of a good year because two new stations were accepted. The Saugus River, it's called an age one plus, a little bit older than glass eels. And the Four River Braintree, it's actually a smelt fike net that catches smelt, but the eel bycatch is considered decent data. So we're, we're pretty proud of this. It takes a lot of work. At the same time, it's a little bit concerning because you might notice all three trends are going down. Those are geometric means with 95% confidence intervals that are fit into models for trend analysis and stock assessment. Unfortunately, all three of our series are, are trending downward for American eel. All right, let me move on to rainbow smelt. Uh, very fast growing, they don't live very long. The, the smelt up top is a one-year-old and that was on a spawning run. The lower smelt is probably a four-year-old, and they don't get a whole lot bigger than that. This is a cold water fish. They have antifreeze proteins that let them stay really active in the winter, so they can keep feeding while other fish are getting dormant. They come up at night in the springtime, and they spawn in these freshwater riffles just above the tide. 
in the Weir River, they spawn below the Fond du Pond Dam. And so that's where they've always spawned. They, they can't go any further because they don't really use fishways. But they don't have big migrations. They stay close to the coast. They put out a demersal egg that sticks to the bottom, and it needs about one to three weeks before it hatches, and the young go right back out immediately to the ocean. That's a, a picture from the 60s from Marina Bay in Quincy. It used to be a huge fishery. Up to 1,000 people would be there on a given night catching smelt. And it, it's not gone, but it's really diminished. So overall, declining populations, we know fishing mortality. We still take smelt, but not a lot. Natural mortality may be a factor because when a population is really depressed and you have a lot of predators, they can really keep that population from rebounding. And we've done a really good job with, I think, bringing back things like you know, otters and osprey, cormorants, striped bass, seals, a lot of these larger predators, and we haven't done a great job with the prey. So I'm a little worried about that. But really what I think is most important is habitat alteration. There's some smelt eggs attached to some clean gravel in the town brook in Quincy. They need clean gravel, and we just don't have much of that anymore. It's unfortunate. That's a photo early in my career at town brook Quincy. The river, the locals said it was black with smelt because you couldn't see the bottom. That for a hundred yards, it was nothing but fish just filling out the whole water column. And I never saw that again. And it's, I think it's, it's really just a thing of the past almost. Talking about their range. So here's a map of the East Coast. The pink is where smelt used to be found down to Maryland. The green is where they're found now. So in 75 years, their range has moved about 400 miles northward. So it's pretty remarkable. I mean, if that was an animal like an alligator, you'd hear about it. It would make the news. It's a smelt and no one knows this has happened. So as we warm, this, this cold water fish is moving further north. Here's a graph that shows the catches of smelt at our fike net in the Jones River in Kingston. The blue line is the 50% cumulative catch or the peak of the catch. And this is Julian date. So it tells us when the peak is occurring. This red line is the onset when they first show up. And what you can see We've only been doing this since 2005, so in 15, 16 years, the peak, the peak and the onset is two weeks earlier. So that, that to me is pretty amazing. They, they, they're coming earlier and they're peaking earlier. So that, that's a fish responding to warming very rapidly. And is that good for them? It's, it's hard to say. It, uh, it, it just To me, it's, it's pretty remarkable to see that change so quickly. And so here's another photograph from early in my career, the Four River and Braintree. One fellow's fishing through the ice for smelt. Um, we don't see this anymore. We just don't see that estuarine ice. Or if you see it, it can't support somebody fishing through it. So that, that's a thing of the past. Another thing occurring is they're coming in at an earlier age. Years ago, most smelt were age two, three, or four. Now in, in the Jones River, oh, here we go. I thought I got rid of this one. All right. Here's the data. A study was done back here for the Jones River, and it found 6% age one smelt. That's the white in the columns over there. And then 23% age three, which is the hash marks in those columns. And then come forward to this year here, we published a study that found the smelt run now had 55% age one and only 3% age three. So it's a compensation, and you see this with populations, maybe with humans, I don't know. But you, you see, when things are stressed, individuals mature earlier. And they come up on the spawning run earlier. So we're seeing more and more of these age one. If we repeat the study presently, I, I think it would be, for the Jones River, it's probably 75, 80% age one fish. And they carry like 10,000 eggs, whereas an age four smelt would carry 50, 60,000 eggs. So that's much lower reproductive potential by the gamble they have, which is a gamble to keep the population going. So it's, it's pretty fascinating. All this is happening in a fairly short period of time. Okay, let me move on to the Weir River watershed. And here's a slide from our geographic information database that shows the different locations. Where fish can go, it's in green. And where they can't, it's in red. And so for river herring, they need to spawn in Foundry Pond or Trip Hammer Pond. Oh, I thought I... Oh, you know what? I, I think I opened a, a different presentation that I worked on earlier. That's okay, we'll, we'll figure this out. I had some information on the different acreages. 
So Foundry Pond is about six acres. Trip Hammer, I think, is about 17. Picture the places that have a fishery would have a thousand acres. So there's not a lot of acreage here to go. Going back to here, um, Cushing Pond has about 19 acres. Fulling Mill Pond has maybe 13. Acord has about 95, but it'd be very hard to get fish there with water supplies, the operations. So in terms of restoration for these fish, I, I think probably your best option here is probably removal of the Foundry Pond Dam, because that would allow several species to move up, smelt, tomcod, and then get rid of the, that passage difficulty for river herring and some others. So that's probably your top <laughs> restoration target. Easier said than done, but maybe it's something that can start and, and it can be a future project. Other than that, I, I think the biggest thing is we heard about you know, water supply and, and trying to find ways to get more water in the river. That's probably the biggest thing to do in this system because it's just every year it seems like a drought year here. And if I were to highlight a third option, it would probably be a long shot to get fish in the Cushing Pond. I think the habitat seems like it's reasonable. Um, pretty difficult passage restoration there but I think that might be a future option as well but clearly your top target is removing that first dam and then you know maybe you know seeing what you can do to get more water in the river I had highlighted smelt habitat they also spawn in that green line next to Hingham Harbor in Townbrook there's a few smelt in Townbrook and then it's there's so few it doesn't really show but um, Turkey Hill Run has a few smelt as well I, I think that's showing further over. So you've got two tiny smelt runs and most of the fish come up the main stem. And this river just shows, this, this map shows you, uh, zooms in on the two river herring spawning habitats. And I, I had some information, but I think I switched presentations. So I guess what I wanna highlight here is there's been a lot of local effort um, by folks. I think Daniel's here, um, oh no, Daniel Wells is in here tonight. But, but he, he and a few others have been really active with stream maintenance. And most of this work occurs leaving Trip Hammer Pond along Acorn Brook. That section where it connects with, with the Weir River is a jungle. And it's just really thick and it needs a lot of attention. And I think it's really what you have to do if you want to keep that herring run going into Trip Hammer Pond. Brad, a question on that. Yep. One of my friends, their property abuts. It's within that stretch. Uh -huh. And a tree fell down from a windstorm right on the Weir River. Yeah. And they can't touch it because the conservation commission in town says you can't you can't touch anything within a certain number of feet of the river. Right. You can't touch it. So that tree is lying there clogging the floor right it, you know well how you, do we go about you you the river? you have what you need there's an approved stream maintenance plan for the weir river that i wrote it was approved in 2019 the conservation commission approved it now with a new dp policy you don't need their approval you what you need is to have a, a plan that dmf prepares excuse me and the plan has to identify who can do the work and very often we identify watershed associations and or DPWs or departments of natural resources. We, we can't just say any, any volunteers. It has to identify either a town group or a watershed group. So right now, um, if, if you that friend connects with a watershed association, they can take that tree out. Yeah. And, and the con, yeah. And the concom wants to hear about it, but it's authorized. That's the beauty of the new policy. Uh, I have a similar situation. Uh, Turkey Hill runs through my property, and a tree fell down across there. Right, this you know, this far above the water level. Should I uh, just go in? It's on my property. Can I go in there and remove it without any? Yeah. See, Turkey Hill Run is not a river herring run; it's a smelt run. Yeah. And so I think that's that. You probably want to check in with the Conservation Commission for that one, or let me know about it. Um, our staff can come out, state law allows that. I think the stream maintenance policy, it really was focused on river herring, which it shouldn't. It should include all species. But I think, you know, you can let me know about that and we can come take a look at it. Um, or connect with DPW can, can do things. Uh, they don't, there's not really a conservation staff, I don't believe in Hingham, but. Um, I think the agents. 
the agent. Yeah. The, the agent can ask the DPW, can you come out and remove that tree? And it, it can just happen. So it's, it's no longer a case where you have to file a permit or file any you know, notification with a conservation commission. You, you're supposed to check in with them. So I think that's a big plus. So let me just go back in time a little bit. These river herring are always very valuable in the town of Hingham. 1637, they gave the rights to the fish to private businesses because it was worth money. By 1805, they had taken it back because they were concerned about, number one, there wasn't a lot of fish because of the dams, but they wanted to save a little bit of fish for the public. 1909, there was a survey done by our agency, the Belding Report, published in 1921. They found very few river herring in the system just below Foundry Pond Dam. More recently, we, did a, we updated a survey in 1972, and again, a small run, moving up the trip hammer and it recognized it was a really important smelt run then one of the top runs in the region 1985 my the dmf fishway crew built the fishway at trip hammer pond and we stocked herring for three years and even back then there was concern expressed on the silting into the pond and there was discussion back then should we dredge it what should we do and uh, we did stock it for three years back then so a little bit on the smelt so late 1800s, there was a publication by Kendall that recognized it as a regionally important smelt fishery, one of the biggest in this region. And then as way back as 1894, they restricted smelt fishing to hook and line. And I think a lot of local folks didn't get the, the, the memo. And so there was lots of dip netting going on in the spawning runs way past that because not everyone listened to the state legislature back then. And the fish were coming up in the spring and they were right there. So I think people dip netted for years, but this was done to try to limit overharvest during a spawning run. 1960s, this publication, Iwanowitz et al, recognized the Weir River as one of the largest smelt runs in Massachusetts. So there was a lot of fish there. More recently, we did a survey. We documented a fair amount of spawning habitat in the Weir River, a decent amount, but, and still in 1994, it was one of the larger runs in the region. I think that the Back River in Weymouth, Neponset River in Neponset, Four River in Braintree were the big three, and this one came in just a little bit below that. So even, the, I was part of that survey, even back then there were a lot of eggs below the dam. And then in 1998, the dam was reconstructed by the town. It was an emergency order. The dam was said to be failing, and they reconstructed it, and they caused a lot of damage to the smelt run. Yeah, I had taken this one out, so I think I must have, as I was getting ready an hour before I, I switched presentations. I, I hope I don't run too late, because I, I know I try to take some out, but this just talks about how there were so many smelt eggs in the Weir River that for many decades, it was used as a source for stocking smelt eggs in other places. Here's Kendall from 1926 saying, that the spawn was wasted, so let's catch them on these trays and put them some other place. And that went on for many years. You can picture when the tide came up to the, the dam, the fish couldn't go anywhere else. So they would crowd themselves and spawn like crazy. And there was excess eggs at those locations. Um, 44 million eggs were moved from the Jones and the Weir Rivers in the 70s. That's a lot. Of, I wish we had that right now. And this was last done in the 1990s. I got involved in some of this and I, I just felt it wasn't a great idea and we soon stopped it. It, you know, you're, you're grabbing eggs from a place that's doing okay and you're putting them someplace else, you're probably better to spend your time and energy on habitat restoration than moving eggs around. The ex river herring is kind of an exception because they can really take with, they, they're more fecund, but we stopped doing smelt transfers in the 1990s. So recent efforts in the Weir River. So we got involved recently, we uh, set a trap at the Foundry Pond Dam to try to figure out, okay, what's there? So we put a trap at the top and we caught river herring. We didn't catch hundreds, but we caught dozens of river herring. We caught trout. We caught a lot of different species, but you would like to have seen thousands of river herring. Soon after we repaired the, that fishway right there, it had a lot of issues with concrete degrading, so we repaired it. And then we came back in 2012 and we tried to reconstruct the channel below the dam so it might be suitable for smelt spawning. Then the town asked us to go up the trip hammer in 2018, 
we repaired that fishway and then we realized that downstream was a, a mess. It was a jungle. So we started doing stream maintenance. And then 2019, I wrote a stream maintenance plan that was approved by the Conservation Commission. And then we wrote a, a trip hammer pond fishway operation and maintenance plan to try to guide the town on how to maintain that fishway and operate that fishway. So here's a little more on that dam reconstruction story. The upper photograph shows the dam when it was reconstructed. And, and if, I don't know if you folks remember, some of you might, it was really craggy below there. There were trees, it was all irregular substrate. It was great for smelt to come and drop their eggs. What they did was they widened the spillway and they got rid of the riffles. They, there was an island there with a tree. They got rid of the island. I got wind of it by the conservation agent that it was happening. I went down there and I talked to the construction crew and I said, do you mind like leaving some boulders in the island and, and some of this irregularity for smelt? And the guy operating the back said, yeah, sure, buddy, no problem. And they just flattened it. I, I went back a few days later and it was, that's what it looked like. So it really became not very good for smelt. The very next year there was an egg kill. The smelt came up in March when the flow was kind of high. And again, they need two to three weeks usually for the eggs to hatch. And the flows declined while the eggs were all below the basin here and there wasn't enough flow to keep the eggs alive and they all turned white. It happened again in 2000 and then in 2001, it was a big egg kill. Millions of eggs died. Same thing, they come in, they spawned and the flows declined and there just wasn't enough water flow and velocity to keep them alive. So we started working with locals on trying to fix this and we started getting design and permitting to build channels for the smelt and to rebuild the island. You know, you wish back then we could have taken the dam out and that, that's the real solution, but it's easier said than done. I think there was a lot of interest in keeping the pond back then. And so I think my agency got a grant. I led the project. I think we spent about 40,000 on construction and about 40,000 on design and permitting. It cost the same amount. And in 2012, it was complete. So here's the they're building the island there and the two channels on either side. And here it is, it's a higher tide, but you can see two channels were put in. And so we thought it was something to do that would at least keep the run from just blinking out. And we came back, we monitored this and smelt were using the channels. They, to this day, they still use the channels, but I think we just don't have the fish we had even back in these years here. Um, they just don't have the habitat. The other thing that's going on is sea level rise. See, the sea level is like before my eyes coming up at this site. I've been come, going there for over 30 years and it comes up so much higher than it used to, it neutralizes the riffles. So you don't have as much good riffle habitat for these fish. So I think long-term, we, we would love to see that dam come out. So we went back in 2018, we did some monitoring. Here's that riffle. And so that, those, are what, those are the conditions smelt want. Turbulence, fast flowing riffles. We found lots of eggs. It was a pretty good year in 2018. They really loaded up the two channels with eggs. And then we found the trip hammer pond fishway to be in disrepair. Some kids or somebody had thrown big rocks into the fishway, like dozens of big boulders. That one was so big, my crew had to crack it. He had to split it before we could lift it out. And so we, we repaired the concrete. We put new boards in. We got rid of the boulders and we did that rehab work in 2018. And then we started saying, whoa, we, we need to get in the river and do some stream maintenance. And so here's some photographs. We, we went out with a conservation agent, Lonnie, in 2017. We saw what was going on and we got involved with some locals. I think the South Shore Flycasters with, uh, with, with Tom Bell and, and, and Daniel Wells and, and others. And a lot of work was done. That lower photograph, I call it water willow. It, it might be an alder or a dogwood but it arches over and it, it roots in the channel. And what it had done to the Weir River below Trip Hammer or Acorn Brook below Trip Hammer, it just broke up the channel and the water just spilled out and it was just a diffuse wide wetland. It was not a channel at all. So a lot of work was done to try to remove some of that. Here's a photograph of that location after we finished. You wanna leave canopy you don't want to take too much buffer on the side. You just want to get things out of the river where the fish might go. And so a lot has been done. 
We have that stream maintenance plan that was approved in 2019. So it's, it's, it's really, it predates the policy, but it's still, it's the same mechanism. It's recognized the work can be done. And I'll have to look at who it, I think it identifies the association and town staff as being able to do this work. So I, I think, you know, let's put that to work. But it, it, it's, I was there tonight or this afternoon before I came here, and it's, it's, there's still sections that are thick. And in a drought year, you don't have the scouring of the sediments. So the sediments have really built up. And it's just, one, you know, a couple high flow years, and you got rocky cobble, and it's nice substrate. A year like this, it's mucky again. So it's really, we, we need more flow above all. Okay, yeah, see, I took this out, sorry. I wanted it to shorten the presentation. I'll just mention quickly, we started stocking shad in the Taunton River this year, working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And it took about five years to set this program up. And over five million shad were stocked in the Taunton River. At the Attleboro Hatcher, they, they stocked for about 40 years Atlantic salmon in the Connecticut River. And they finally said, you know, it's not working. The, the Connecticut River is just no longer suitable for this cold water fish. So they wanted to shift to a different species. So we're working with them to, to work with shad. And I think shad is a fish that could do well with warming because they, they're pretty abundant down south. So this began, and uh, hopefully there'll be some more happy anglers like that with these larger fish that can be caught. So we, were, we did some seining to look for shad for five years before we started stocking. We caught zero shad with the seining. We caught a few electro fishing. And then this year, we went out, we caught the shad in June and July, nice numbers of them. And then in October, we caught these larger shad juveniles here. We saved samples for genetic analysis, but we're pretty sure they're our fish because we didn't catch them for five years before. So we think this might be a successful project. And, you know, stocking, some people don't think stocking is a great idea. I think for species like shad and river herring, it can help if you have good habitat. But really, your first goal all the time is to do habitat restoration. So I want to talk briefly about some large watershed projects. These are places where the spawning and nursery habitat for river herring was cut off a long time ago by usually one or more dams. And so you're looking at an opportunity to open things up to get them back to where they used to go. And it's usually a large spawning and nursery habitat. None of these really connect for the Weir River. So I want to mention one example nearby, the Mystic River watershed. So th this is, again, is our GIS data layer, and it shows red where fish can't access. It shows green where they go. Every dot has data on what species are present and what type of project is recommended. If the dot is red, it means they can't pass. Yellow means something could be done, and green means things are good. So this is from 2011. They couldn't pass into the upper Mystic Lake. The Department of Conservation and Recreation, they reconstructed that lake in 2012 and they put a fishway in. And that project included a fishway, an eel ramp, and it was really a nice opportunity to give fish a chance to move up. So we, we fast forward to present and you can see all that green has opened up. There were two other projects that helped that. Here's a case where you really couldn't take the dams out because they were big recreational areas. So all these projects were fishways and they really opened up habitat to about 287 acres that was inaccessible before these projects. And so we're pretty excited about that. And then as soon as it happened, the numbers started going up. Here's a graph that shows the spawning run counts in thousands, so numbers of fish. As soon as that fishway came in, the numbers just went, went up and up and up. In 2017, it was a top run in Massachusetts at about 700,000 fish. And then it hit over 800,000 fish. And we were, you know, getting kind of, you know, cocky about this slide, just saying, hey, it's going to keep going up. And then the next couple of years, it dropped. Of course, you're still at a, a decent level, three, 400,000. And in 2022, which was a down year, it was the top count in Massachusetts. So again, I, I think a pretty successful restoration effort by targeting places where fish used to go, but they, they were prevented for from dams a long time ago. Yeah, I cut this one out too. Oh well, I gotta talk about it. So, so here's Stump Brook, and it's a tributary to the Taunton River, 
and a dam was removed. The cotton gin mill dam was removed in 2017 that allowed fish to reach Robbins Pond. But there's a dam here where they can't get over. If you can get fish past there, you've got over 500 acres in the Montponset Pond system where they could spawn. So DMF is leading this project presently, and it's really the, the biggest potential opening of spawning nursery habitat in Massachusetts. It is, there's none other quite close to it. So it needs a fishway. We're before the Conservation Commission right now to get a fishway here, a little bit of work at those two yellow dots, and then we can probably get fish into the Montponset Pond. So again, multiple sites, large you know, risk, high reward to get the fish back to these native habitats. Okay, here's just shows the dam there that needs a fishway. It's not a big dam. It's owned by a cranberry bog farmer. He has water rights. He doesn't want to lose the water rights, so there's, there's no forcing him to take the dam out. So that's why we're going to look at building a fishway. And so we got a grant from the Taunton River Watershed Stewardship Council, 25000 to design and permit this, and then my crew will build this for about $7,000. It's a pretty small aluminum ladder. All right, so these are DMF fishway crew projects in 2022. I just wanted to highlight some of the jobs we do. Here's replacing a weir at the Cape Cod Canal fishway owned by the Army Corps. Um, you might recognize the Indian Head River on the Pembroke Hanover line. We replaced about a third of the baffles and patched up some concrete this year. Then we fixed the fishway down the Cape where a third, it was a 65 foot fishway that was collapsing. And so these are cases where the property owners paid for materials and, and we did the work fairly inexpensively. So I think it's, a, it's an efficient way to fix up some of these fishways working with our crew. And then here's the, a slide on stream channel maintenance. So what's happening, you know, in a natural cis, uh, setting spring flows will scour out a stream and you don't really need to get out there and do stream maintenance. We're way past that. We just don't have that much anymore. So tree falls, debris jams, and this plant encroachment can cause problems. The lower photo shows uh, Town River and Bridgewater where a tree fall just kept jamming up and all of a sudden juvenile river herring were getting impinged on the upstream side of that. That's how thick it was. And so you had to get in there with a chainsaw and take it out. So we've been having trouble getting some conservation commissions to approve this activity. So we work with DP to get a new policy. It came out in April, and it says that if you have a stream maintenance plan written by DMF, you can do this work, and it doesn't need further review under the Wetlands Protection Act. So I think that's a plus. That's a link to it. I can get that to you if you folks want. So far, we've got 12 town approved plans, including Hingham. Hingham has a plan. And I want to say it isn't always just debris jams and tree falls. Sometimes the leaf falls in the fall can catch and kill these river herring if it's shallow. I've seen that again and again. They get caught. Sometimes it's like a sand berm. So, so many of these rivers are just flow starved. And it's just become a big issue in my career where it really wasn't that big of a deal years ago because we had more flow in these coastal rivers. Okay, so here's Another point on native invasive plant encroachment. I'm seeing things like swamp loose strife. Uh, again, I'm calling it water willow. It might be a dogwood here in the Weir River. And then Phragmites, which is invasive, just choking off the channel. And fish either can't get through or it's causing flows just to go over the banks and it becomes more of a wetland than a defined river. Okay, so here's a little bit on our geographic information data layer. The dots are all the locations where there's fishways, dams, things that can impede fish. There's over 475 sites in Massachusetts. It's being used right now for agencies to plan restoration, plan transportation improvements, infrastructure improvements. We want to publish it as a public layer that anybody can open up, look in their town, and look at sites that can be improved. And we want to, we are conducting a fish passage survey, we're updating one done 20 years ago to visit all these locations to get up-to-date information. And it's a credit to the restoration community that many of these sites in 20 years have changed. There's been a lot of restoration that's occurred, so there's a lot we need to update. And I want to just give one more example of this large watershed restoration and also highlight this data layer. So the data layer, you click on a reach, and it'll tell you what species are present for diatomous fish. 
It'll tell you if we have survey work going on, you know, for shad, river herring, eel, or, rip, or smelt. And again, if it's red, they can't go. This is Silver Lake in Kingston in 2011. Two dams were removed, and all of a sudden, well, we had to put a fishway in up here as well, and all of a sudden, the fish have access to Silver Lake for the first time in well over 100 years. So it's a nice highlight to, I think, our data layer, and it's also a good example of how multiple sites, two dam removals, one fishway at the top dam, and we've got river herring into the 640-acre Silver Lake. This site is heavily limited by flow. I was there today. Fish cannot get out. So it's mid-November, and the juvenile herring can't leave. So, you know, there's a lot of sites like this where in a drought year, you just can't get the juveniles out. And it's not good because they, they need to leave these ponds when it gets cold so they can feed on zooplankton in the ocean. Because the zooplankton, they stop being active right about now, and they need to get out. And so we're happy about the restoration efforts here, but the work is not done by any means. Okay, so let me wrap up by just talking about some concepts. You know, river herring, there's been a lot of work done. We had much higher populations 50, 75 years ago, and we had much poorer fish passage conditions. There's been a lot of fish passage improvements, and yet the populations are much lower. And then further, the, the Clean Water Act did wonders to reduce all the industrial pollution in these rivers. If you think about some of these industrial locations, um, and, and so with those two processes, you would think would have better numbers of river herring, but we're, not, we're seeing a very modest response. And so I wanted to put these things up there to have people think about them. Coastal development is so obvious. We've, we've changed our coastline dramatically. Climate change is a question mark because I think for some species it's going to help and other species it won't. Tom Cod and smelt are cold water fish. They probably are in trouble with, in Massachusetts with climate change. Natural mortality, I, I don't want to leave these out because we do catch fish out in the ocean. And I think we've done a, a good job as wildlife managers to restore predators. And we haven't done a very good job with their prey. But I just want to leave you with the idea that I think these two concepts under the category of coastal development are important. Eutrophication, which is nutrient loading. And so I think what's happening is we're degrading the spawning and nursery habitats through nutrient loading. And if you can picture trip hammer, it's a lot more shallow than it used to be. It's a lot weedier. And so there's less space for these fish to occupy. So I'm concerned about eutrophication. Even more important, we're all concerned about water use. These fish have to be able to get out. And more and more, it's a limitation. And they can't get out. Assawampsit Pond Complex in Lakeville for the Namaskat River, biggest spawn nursery habitat in Massachusetts, they can't leave right now. It's November 17th, and they still can't get out. So there's a lot of concern there. So I just want to say, okay, what can we do? Again, kind of preaching the obvious, these rivers need more water. We have to find some ways through reduced consumption or through regulation that puts more water back in the rivers. And that's, it's, it's hard to do, but I think we heard earlier discussion about this. I think it's a really important role for watershed associations to try to find ways to get more rivers, more water in rivers. And then we have to look at every watershed and say, okay, what can we do to reduce nutrient loading? What can we do to get more water in there? Every system's different, and we have to evaluate that. I think stream maintenance is part of the puzzle. You know, we, in places that are getting choked off, if we want to keep the herring runs, we have to do some stream maintenance. And it, it, it was done ages ago. It's just hard to do now under the Wetlands Protection Act. So I think that's something to consider. And I think pond level management's important. Um, allow water to build up and then have releases that could send the fish out when it's safe based on a, a known pond level. So I think there's some management we can do there, um, working together to figure these things out. So I just wanted to leave you with that pitch. Um, I gave a talk last week at the Union Club in Boston on the Boston Commons. It was the Boston Flycasters asked me to come up. And inside the building, they had this picture, original map from 1819, John Hales of the Boston Harbor area and my wife kept saying, why are you spending so much time looking at that map? And I was like, these are all the rivers I work in. And in 1819, there were very few dams. Most of them were open to these spawning areas that are like inaccessible. So it was really, it was pretty amazing to think about how far we've gone and how we're making progress bit by bit. And maybe we can, we can find some winners, I think, 
in these watersheds. Some will be very tough, but I think we can find some ways to get these fish back. So that's something I wanted to leave you with. And yep, that's it. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>